Um, I just want to join in the chorus of thanks to the organizers. Can everybody hear me? I have a very loud voice. I'm not overdoing it. For organizing this amazing conference and also for putting me on this great uh, panel with Michelle, Misha, and Monica. Um, uh, and I'll try to keep things lively because I know we're going to have presentation fatigue at this point. So here we go. In 1943, Brazil's Estado Novo, the new state, mounted one of the country's first official exhibitions of modern art to be mounted in the National Museum of Fine Arts, a large-scale retrospective of the artist Lazar Segal. The exhibition attracted massive crowds of some 15,000 people attending over the show's eight-week run. It also generated significant controversy. Within two weeks of its opening, a coalition of vigilantes mobilized to stand 24-hour guard in response to rumors that angry protesters would storm the museum and destroy the work within. Not only was the imagery of the poor, immigrants, prostitutes, and victims of war deemed unpatriotic, but xenophobic and anti-Semitic attacks targeted the artist, a naturalized Brazilian of Lithuanian Jewish descent, questioning his citizenship and decrying his pictures as a foreign threat to the domestic, social, and moral order. Despite Seagal's personal commitment to the absolute autonomy of art, National and geopolitical debates charged the controversy. Defenders of the exhibition rebuked the attacks as the work of a fascist fifth column, parroting Nazi theories of degenerate art. The Ministry of Education and Health, which organized the exhibition, seized on the opportunity to provoke Brazil's ideological distance from totalitarianism, issuing an official response that, quote, the state does not have a monopoly on aesthetic tendencies nor will it wrap itself in the discriminatory indolence that peers' critics want to attribute to it, and even less in the suspicious zeal for racial purity." Unquote. In form and content, Seagal's modernist interpretations of Afro-Brazil, Jewish, and immigrant themes seem to resonate with the holistic logic of this defense that equated modern art, expressive freedom, and representative democracy. Yet several factors troubled this equation, not the least of which was the authoritarian nation of nature of the Estado Novo, which President Getulio Vargas referred to with the dubious euphemism of a functional democracy, quote unquote, and which had incorporated the doctrine of racial democracy as official ideology, subsuming political participation within utopian ideals of the exclusive rights of the collective and the myth of racial equality. And I don't know how familiar everybody is with racial democracy, but it was one of these kind of anti-positivist uh, rejections of the scientific racism that really boosted the social ideologies of the First Republic that the Vargas Revolution of 1930 brought down. And it's mainly advocated by anthropologists located at Columbia and in Moas, uh, Jaberti Freire, who's uh, reacting against the Jim Crow South, looking at why Brazil has more equal racial relations attributing it to more benign um, conditions of slavery uh, that allowed for uh, racial mixings, and so therefore they preclude the possibility of racism. So Gaul's melancholy portraits of disaffection were far removed from official imaginings of Estado Novo citizenship, allegorized in the heroic mixed-race worker-citizen. Moreover, unlike the fascist states of Europe, artistic mm -hmm. policy was not hegemonic. To the contrary, it was highly contested and fiercely debated. Accordingly, the criticism, which extended to the state's support of the exhibition, emanated not from a marginal fascist fringe, as historic accounts tend to suggest, but it originated from deeply within the, the administration. This paper examines the controversy in relation to the art exhibited, which figured only nominally in debates in the press, and which scholarship has likewise failed to explicitly engage. I contend that Seagal's aesthetic issued distinctly Jewish claims to universalism at odds with the utopian ideals of the Estado Novo, troubling reformist constructions of citizenship and revealing key consistencies within the political heterodoxy of competing ministries, foremost among them a fundamental unease with the future of Brazil's mixed-race society. At the twilight of the Estado Novo, the show underscored the freedoms denied civil society, subsumed within the promise of modern art, while simultaneously enacting the inadvertent and ultimately subversive exercise thereof, this exercise of freedom. As a public relations tool, Seagal's retrospective was fortuitous. After years of strategic neutrality, while Brazil courted its two biggest trading partners, Germany and the United States, 
The torpedoing of, torpedo of six Brazilian merchant ships by Axis submarines had forced Brazil to declare war on Germany in August 1942. Allegiance with the U.S. inspired a wave of student protests against fascism, which illuminated the central paradox of the Brazilian public sphere, that one could publicly protest European authoritarian, authoritarianism while subject to dictatorial conditions at home. In 1937, President Getulio Vargas had overthrown his own government to establish the populist, corporatist Estado Novo. Party participation and voting rights were exchanged for privileges and opportunities guaranteed by the state, administered largely through labor protections. In this context, the Ministry of Education and Health, led by modernist enthusiast Gustavo Cabanema, who deemed the office the Ministry of Man, undertook to create a new society and a new Brazilian citizenship, according to this Trabalhista ideology of citizenship through labor, uh, through improved health, expanded welfare, and most importantly, education. And just before I change this, I just want to show that this week, the yeah, Fascist Week, is in the downtown Ceilandia Plaza, and this is at the National Theater, uh, which directly faces the Museum where Segal's show was opening at the exact same time. Art and culture were central to the mission of the MEH, the Ministry of Education and Health, supported, um, and the MEH supported modern art and architecture as egalitarian and redemptive. Yet a competing ministry, the Department of Press and Propaganda, which I'll call the JIPI, as they do in Brazil, uh, a fascist stronghold responsible for censorship and counter subversion vied with the MEH for control of cultural management. And when Vargas overthrew his own uh, government, rather than jailing his opponents, he tended to co-opt them into his own administration, which is a massive corporatist bureaucracy. And therefore, you do find the, this real ideological heterodoxy. And the Jiffy was a, a notorious center of uh, ex integralists and fascists. Between the two ministries, modern art became a political football with Capanema constricting a modernist coterie, largely from Sao Paulo, to lead the process of national renewal. The Jiffy in turn harassed and interrogated modern artists, particularly those from Sao Paulo, a center not only of modern art, but of anti Vargas opposition and labor agitation and artists uh, on the MEH pay payroll were not excluded from their surveillance and intimidation and often got dragged in by the secret police despite or different state. The suspicions toward modern art that permeated the DP were laid out in a pamphlet by Judge Raul Machado, who headed the National Security Tribunal, entitled Insidious Communists Within the Brazilian Art and Letters. The text decried modernism as dangerously egalitarian lacking hierarchical form and cultural order, and destined to spread a mistrust of government. Bolshevik in origins and nature, the treaties contended, modern art, quote, destroys borders in the propagation of an international proletariat and the demands and necessities of international finance, unquote. And under no circumstance could it be nationalist or nationalized. Machado's anti-communist paranoia resonated in the attacks on Segal, who being Russian, Jewish, and Sao Paulo, from Sao Paulo was triply suspect. Over the course of several weeks, dozens of reactionary diatribes were published in the right-wing press, decrying alternately the imagery, the artist, and the MEH. While such rhetoric has circulated since the 1930s, what distinguished the controversy was the anti-Semitic aspersions that underpin nativist suspicion of art, although there were clear dog whistles earlier with the reference to the national finance. Segal was maligned in the deeply contradictory terms of Brazilian anti-Semitism as impure, a mongrel, insane, diseased, degenerate, and also elitist, wealthy, and duplicitous. Critics saw in his art a foreign and subversive gaze incompatible with Brazilian identity, condemning his image of war, which I'm showing you here, as spir a spiritually corrosive anti-militarist painting, that's a quote, that threatened to enervate public will and, quote, debilitate individual morale, unquote. Critic Carlos Mau accused Segal of treason, while publisher Cipriano Laghi agreed the artist should be brought before the security tribunal. Segal's defenders likewise conscripted his art to the war effort, yet in antithetical terms. Symbiotic forces of credibility charged his work with a refusal of fascist intolerance and an aura of Rooseveltian democracy opportune for the state's increasingly problematic politics. 
An internationally known modern artist with German expressionist pedigree, Chagall was well known for his contribution to the development of Brazilian modernism in the 1920s. And I left out any biographical information. He was born in Vilnius in the end of the 19th century into a kind of a middle-class family that was wealthy and enlightened enough to send him to art school in Germany. In 1906, he started in Berlin, moved to Dresden, where he was part of the Dresden Expressionist movement, and ended up immigrating to uh, Brazil in the very end of 23. He already had several siblings in Brazil, and uh, all of his family would be there by the end of the 1920s. He came with a German wife, but he ended up um, uh, divorcing her and marrying into the Flavian family, another Lithuanian Jewish family that was very rich and prominent in Brazil. Uh, moreover, Skull's work had been exhibited and destroyed in the 1938 Degenerate Art Show in Munich, and he had shown the year before in New York's Neumann Wilder Gallery to favorable reviews from U.S. critics. Thus, one Brazilian supporter implored, quote, we are in a moment in which our painters should give the preponderance of their contribution to the war effort to benefit a great common cause. And this is what Sibal does in various paintings in which the mastery of execution elevates the content of dramatic revolt against everything that fascism represents through savagery and anti-humanism. Indeed, the notion of the show as anti-fascist was a common denominator in the publicity and the support. Novelist Jorge Amado discussing the works Pogrom and Immigrant Ship exclusively. And these uh, images are, are uh, appear far more than any other image, despite the fact that most of the show was kind of these pastoral landscapes and um, a lot of portraits and a lot of still lives, a lot of very chip, uh, typical compositions, but neither the sport nor the uh, dissent against the show had anything to do with many of those. So in discussing these work, uh, Jorge Amado repeatedly referred to Sadal's quote, social and quote, anti-Nazi aesthetic. He lauded the artist, who he writes is a quote, Jew by race, yet a very Brazilian painter, unquote, for his quote, contribution to an anti-fascist struggle valued by our government, unquote. Amado insinuates what elsewhere is addressed explicitly, that Sadal's own status as a naturalized Jewish immigrant and his modernist renderings of anti-fascist themes expresses the virtues of a specifically Estado Vista modernity as egalitarian, inclusive, humanist, and aesthetically and socially progressive. More specifically, the press applauded Segal's, quote, numerous paintings that synthesize our immigration policy. These are documentation that none can discount, one account reported, quote, when the ship arrives in the country called Brazil, it will be received with open arms. They will reconstruct their home and with the Brazilian population, contribute to the development of the new nation, unquote. It would have been difficult for any viewer not to recall the grievous account of the Cabo de Hornos when viewing Segal's emigrant ship. In 1941, the story of the Spanish ship transporting some 100 Polish and Czech refugees carrying expired visas had occupied the press for several weeks as the vessel and its passengers languished in Rio de Janeiro Harbor. After protracted debate among diplomats and lawmakers, the ship carrying not Jewish refugees, according to the state, but, quote, false temporaries, and this is in accordance with the deracialized language of British democracy. The ship was turned back to its port of embarkation, and luckily it was taken in subsequently in Martinique, so all the passengers survived. Despite the accolades Segal's work inspired, in practice, immigration policy was inconsistent and capricious, reflecting similar ambivalence toward Jews in general. While Brazil's widely celebrated ambassador to France secretly issued Jews visas well beyond official quotas, his counterpart in Germany invented his own J visa to restrict Jewish entry. Historian Jeffrey Lesser has discussed at length how philo-Semitic and anti-Semitic stereotypes influence policy and popular opinion, casting Jews at once as communist and capitalist, financially astute and undeservedly rich, and at the same time poor, anti-modern, unassimilable products of distant Oriental ghettos. Most troubling is Jews were non-black when residents and non-white when refugees, meaning how they were considered for immigration reasons. Baffling contradictions that lead Lesser to conclude that, quote, racial democracy was never about democracy, rather it was about a concept of race that easily pointed to the other. Segal's work facilitated such discrepant attitudes and interpretations due to its epistemological and aesthetic difference from norms in Brazil, both modernist and traditionalist, and this is a big point in my bigger argument is that he's always, you know, the traditionalists hold him up against these great 19th century history painters 
but he's really doing nothing closer to what the Estado Novo modernists are doing, and both sides are misunderstanding uh, his work. Challenging his description uh, to any political ideology, Seagal declared, quote, art has nothing to do with politics. Dismayed by the rise of social realism after the revolution of 1930, which also dismayed him, the revolution in general, Seagal conveyed, quote, proletariat art does not exist. The artist is and always will be an individualist. He controls, he clarifies, he discovers the truth. His mission is to educate the collective, educate in the sense of revealing the humanity of art. The subjects don't matter. What matters is that the work reveals love, happiness, pain, and nostalgia. Proletarian art, from a political point of view, believes in utopia, which uh, Seagal dismissed as folly. As if to drive the point home, uh -oh. sorry about that. As if to drive the point home, Seagal's imagery, imagery projected a dystopian view of the world, which issued a powerful universalist commitment based in Jewish tradition and experience. Above all, Seagal's art addressed the moral capacity for suffering, particularly in the context of subordination, and the redemptive promise of peace. In Pogrom, for example, the artist depicts the massacre not through the victim's suffering, but portraying, in Seagal's words, quote, transcendental calm. The bodies float in an unsettling spectral vortex, overlapping and extending to defy a symbol of perspective. Seagal explicitly challenged political interpretations of the work, such as that of Giorgio Amato, who described the picture as, this is Amato's description, a group, of a group executed by the Nazis in front of the ruins of their destroyed, destroyed homes, unquote. In contrast, Seagal contended that art is never in the service of politics, and therefore I don't consider Pogrom a pol pictorial polemic. Notice the figures, he explained. There is no shout of revolt. There are no curses, no screams of pain, no hopelessness. Rendered in the repose of inanimate beings, I envision a spectator that wonders revolted, but why have they died? Why were they sacrificed? In Seagal's work, redemption is not a narrative theme. Rather, the work invi invites the viewer to actually inhabit a moral universe familiar to the marginal, the beleaguered, and the repressed. In so doing, replacing normative and assimilationist notions of modernity with the universalism of the weak. Confirming the distance between production and reception, Seagal's emigrant ship with an E was consistently interpreted as an immigrant ship with an I, a subtle distinction with significant semiotic and philosophical repercussions. The immigrant arrives, resides, assimilates, and begins a new life. The immigrant is saved. The emigrant is always departing, displaced, itinerant, and in between. Many journalists recognized the universal significance of the image and compared it to a slave ship. But within the discourse of racial democracy, inclusion was normative and coercive, defining emancipation as the adoption of an elite-led vision of culture and civilization. The hierarchical and assimilative construction of modernity was diametrically opposed to Seagal's universalism from below predicated on genuine coexistence, something that you knew well from experience and that was codified in theological texts. Seagal identified displacement and exile as the defining experience conditioning his aesthetic. Discussing emigrant ship, he recalled the story of what he called a phantom ship that sailed the seas, quote, without direction, a ship crammed full of men belonging to a certain race. Nobody wanted them. They were exiled from the world. Long before the ship's start on its phantasmagorical voyage to the forbidden ports of the world, this state of spirit had already existed. It is powerfully reflected in the work to which I am dedicated." Unquote. Critics and supporters attached many to Seagal's work relative to their own vision of the future of society. These visions, whether conservative or progressive, intersect at a shared doubt regarding Seagal's own immutable difference reflective of a more general Jewish problem that betrayed the utopian promise of racial democracy. Even Seagal's friend and confidant, modernist poet Mario de Andrade, who authored the adulatory catalog text for the exhibition, struggled with Seagal's Jewish al alterity, writing, I can be a very good comrade to him, but he does not ho hold any hope of friendship for me. I am unable to like the man, Lazar Seagal, although I recognize that some of his defects possibly derive more from his race than from him individually. Beyond any doubt, race is not what bothers me, but that he has acquired many of his unpleasant ways of being, 
from the injustices and persecution that they have suffered for 2,000 years. And this is in a letter to uh, what's the closest figure to the official painter of the Estado Novo, Camilo Portinari, who is the one who really um, canonizes this iconography of the black worker, and this heroic worker. And a lot of this article is really about, this all tends to conflate marginality in the shared condition of Jews and blacks, and it's these images of blackness that really disrupt the, the myth of, of racial democracy, um, and that uh, Brazilians had no problem of representing black labor. But it, when it came to <coughs> representing blackness outside of black labor, it, it rep created a crisis of representation that extends to a political crisis, and that's a bigger part of this uh, argument. Um, and I just want to close in the way I tell my students to never do, <laughs> to never conclude by introducing new material, but to get back to my original argument that I barely get to, that art really provides a unique tool of, of resistant democracy, particularly relative to um, Seagal's perspective as an outsider, and this involves the institutional and physical states of the museum, which is another aspect of this exhibition that's almost never discussed, but it's the first uh, modern show in the National Museum. And the National Museum was a highly contested space of citizenship at the time. Considering the second only to the classroom, the MEH had worked tirelessly to democratize museums with some reformers, namely Mario de Andrade, going so far as to propose mandatory visits by students and workers. Although this was never realized, museum visitation increased threefold during the Estado Novo and became a frequent pastime of the middle class, a relatively recent demographic that expanded exponentially with the growth of the corporatist bureaucracy. Two qualities that characterize the, and this is what a journalist saw, the writers, bankers, journalists, educators, and military officers, unquote, who indiscriminately lingered before scholars work with admiration and curiosity. Those are quotes from a journalist. Are the two qualities that these are relevant. First, a moral independence that often challenged the state's vision of society, unlike the more thoroughly re-educated working class. And second, a lack of an art viewing habitus in Bordeaux's terms that would have established a sense of comfort in the space of the museum. One paragraph. This might happen in those efforts. Oh, I have a slide. The exhibition. Okay. Despite Cabanana's efforts, the museum remained a conservative stronghold with its inner circle closely aligned with the Dippy that also organized exhibitions. On the one side, therefore, Seagal's critics saw a bellicose invasion of the tradition represented by the museum, while the other side, in the word of Cabanana, uh, saw a space of, quote, democratic life that allows free debate. If the often salacious attacks against Seagal and the press attracted throngs of curious visitors, many of whom were unaccustomed to both museums and modern art. The ideological instability of the space and the highly polarized terms of the debate did little to orient this novice viewer, and in effect prepared the viewer for both an individuated response and one charged with social and political meaning. In this unscripted, effective capacity responses to Seagal's exhibition, thus reshaped the museum as a space of participation making it live up to the democratic designs vociferously proclaimed in the doctrine of racial democracy and commitment to free expression, yet effectively betrayed by the limits of citizenship imposed by the populist authoritarian state. Thank you.